Hello and welcome to Making Tech Better, Made Tech's fortnightly podcast bringing you content from all over the world on how to improve your software delivery. My name is Claire Sudbury, my pronouns are she and her, and I am a lead engineer at Made Tech. On the 13th of October 2021, I spoke to Emily Bache about refactoring which is a process engineers use to improve existing code. I first came across Emily when I was running a refactoring workshop and I needed good examples for the participants. And I had Emily's GitHub repo recommended to me where I found the Gilded Rose Cata and tons of other useful examples, all designed to help people improve their refactoring skills. Emily specializes in helping engineers to hone their skills across software development, and she really knows her stuff, so I was very excited to talk to her. Hello, Emily. Hello. Oh, it's so lovely to have you here. Okay, I'm going to leap straight in and say, who in this industry are you inspired by? So I wanted to name Kent Beck. I read his book on extreme programming in 2000 and loved it. And that's been a huge influence on on me. So I've got to have Kent on my list. And I was so pleased when he agreed to write the foreword to my recently published book. And then maybe in the same kind of theme, Martin Fowler, G. Paul Hill, you know, these pioneers in the extreme programming kind of world. And then more recently, Llewellyn Falco has been a great inspiration to me. And continuous delivery crowd like Jez Humble, Dave Farley, these people. Yeah, so these are kind of the people who inspire me. Fantastic. Great names. Okay, thank you. So what we're going to be talking about today is something that I know you know a lot about. Generally, we're going to be talking about refactoring. So I'm going to start with a really simple one. What does the term refactor mean to you? Well, I I like Martin Fowler's definitions. You know, it's a verb, it's a noun, it's a vocabulary, it's a bunch of names of operations you can do on code to preserve behavior and improve structure. It's It's a skill. Being able to refactor is a skill that you can learn. And refactoring can be really fun when it's going well. Mm. So refactoring is a noun. This is a change made to the internal structure of software to make it easier to understand and cheaper to modify without changing the observable behavior. So that's what Martin Fowler's refactoring book is about. It's a catalog of, of named refactorings, nouns, all the ones that you can do. And then refactoring is a verb, though. That's the activity of restructuring software by applying a series of refactorings without changing the observable behavior. So it means both. It means the activity of improving the design to make it easier to understand and cheaper to modify, but also this catalog of steps that you can do that should be uh, safe and behavior preserving. I really like that about Martin's definition when he says easier to understand and cheaper to modify, because I think... Often people aren't entirely clear about why they're refactoring. They might just say, I don't like this bit, or we don't like this bit as a team, and we think it needs fixing, but they're not necessarily clear about why. What is the aim? And I think sometimes that can lead to problems with people's approach. One of the things that I've seen is people viewing a refactor as a whole project in itself. We are going to rewrite this code and we're going to put everything aside and spend several weeks rewriting this code. Do you agree that there are problems with that approach or can be? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) I mean, that's the symptom of technical debt where there's a gap between the actual design that you have and the design that you need to have in order to add the features you need to add. Mm -hmm. So you need to refactor your design so it will support the new feature. And if you have been neglecting this for too long, then it can be a big project. Um, It can take weeks and you need to have very difficult conversations with your product owner or your business people about what you're actually spending your time on. Because by definition, if you're refactoring, there's no observable difference. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult for managers then to have a meaningful conversation about a refactoring project because fundamentally they can't see what it is you're doing. So you don't want to get in that situation if you can help it. Yeah. So how do you avoid it? Well, yeah, that's the small, constant attention to detail and and constant improvements and an iterative and incremental method where you're getting that constant feedback about what you're going to build next 
and adapting your design of what you've got now towards being able to support what you've now realized you're going to build next. Mm. So it's a constant small adjustments. Yeah. Not this big bang refactoring project that takes weeks or months. Yeah. And so how granular is that? The reason I ask the question is because I think about people quite often use the paradigm red green refactor when they're talking about test driven development. So for instance, you write a test, a failing test, you see it fail, then you make it pass, and then you refactor. And at that point, that should be a really small amount of code that you're already thinking, how can I improve this? How can I make it easier to understand and cheaper to modify? Do you agree with that? Or do you stand by that, that every single test has to have a refactoring stage within its development? Well, of course, it should be in your mind to think about that. It won't always happen after every single test. But I mean, the number of people who are actively doing TDD is not very large, honestly. Mm -hmm. I think refactoring is almost a broader skill or a more frequently employed skill, I guess, because if you're building new functionality in a code that wasn't built for testability, you might not have very good tests, but you still need to refactor it. Yes, Yes. So refactoring takes place in other contexts as well. Yeah. Not just in TDD. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're thinking about making it easier to add new features, for instance, when you're just working on one very small aspect of one very small piece of functionality and just one test, the refactor step at that point might simply be this little bit of code. I'm making this easier to understand and cheaper to modify. I'm not necessarily thinking about the next feature and how this whole bit of code is going to support that. But should I be? <laughs> no, no. I mean, at the level of TDD, you're thinking about the, the problem in front of you and, and the thing you're doing. Mm. It's when you get to the next feature and you realize that actually this design doesn't really support this. That's when maybe you plan a, a slightly larger refactoring, but hopefully not catastrophically large. Yeah. I mean, that's when it gets really bad, when the design is decayed to the point where you can't really estimate how long it's going to take things because there's so much to do first before you can get to it. Okay, so that kind of brings two questions into mind. One, which we've kind of covered, but I'd still like to dig into a bit more. of How do you prevent the code base from getting to that state in the first place? But then the next one will be, given that it is, because they often are, then what? So, so let's start with the first one. How do you try to avoid getting to that state in the first place? So I think there are two aspects of it. Firstly is the culture and the second is the skill. You can get some very skilled individuals who know how to do refactoring, but if they haven't managed to spread that as a culture in their organization, then they can you know, improve code and then the next person comes along and makes it worse again. Mm -hmm. it's, it needs to be kind of a, an organizational culture that's supported and and understood and technical leadership around that, you know, in this organization, we keep the code well factored mm. and we invest in the code quality. And that's our normal way of working. And plus that people get some training and instruction. It's not something that software developers spontaneously develop refactoring skills. In my experience, that's rare. Yeah. There needs to be some support for training and development. Mm. Okay. So if we want people to learn good refactoring skills, we've talked about using small steps. We've talked about Martin Fowler's book, where there's a whole kind of catalogue of different refactorings that you can do. Are they the two main components in learning good refactoring skills? How does somebody learn to be good at refactoring? It's a practical skill, just like uh, programming is a practical skill. So um, you need teaching, you need to do practice, you need to do exercises, you need to get feedback on your work. These are all things that can happen just during normal work as pair programming. Code review is less so. I think because it's a practical skill, it's a much more practical way to learn it, to have somebody sitting with you, showing you, helping you as you work. Yeah. So pair programming, ensemble working, and then, of course, self-study, uh, reading books. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I'm really interested in the ensemble idea. I've just been reading, haven't finished yet, but I'm very much enjoying your book. I can't remember the exact title, but it's something like technical coaching using the Saman method. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that you talk about, which I just think is a brilliant idea, is visiting teams who are already um, fully set up, teams who are in production, and helping them to learn not just refactoring skills, but test-driven development and, you know, all of the skills that come with good software development by spending time with them as an ensemble. Do you want to talk a bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So this is what I do now. I'm a technical coach. 
and I've got refactoring skills and TDD skills and and I like to uh, try and help people, teams, to learn these skills. And I find that if you can get the whole team to work together on a programming task in an ensemble, then I can join that ensemble and prompt them and mentor them to start using more refactoring techniques, write more tests, improve their skills at these things. And that can happen as part of their normal work on their production software. When I coach teams, quite often the first bit is just teaching them these skills of ensemble working. And then once they've got the hang of that a bit more, then we can start getting moving a bit more on like refactoring skills and stuff. And in case it's not clear, some people may have heard the term mob programming, which is used quite commonly to describe the ensemble. Uh, and I know that's not a term that you like to use because of the, the negative connotations, but I'm just mentioning it so that people realise that it's the same thing. That's, that's what we're talking about. Yeah, it's just different names for the same thing. And I, I just think it sounds more like what it is when you say we're going to work in an ensemble. It's just that's yes. much more positive. Yes, absolutely. And I agree. So in order for people to learn these skills, it's a practical skill. It's something that you're not just going to read in a book. It's something that you have to practice. Uh, and because it's a practical skill, it helps to have a mentor, somebody who's experienced, who can go through all of the subtleties with you, uh, of all of the different scenarios. That's exactly the way I see it. That I, I like to make this analogy with skiing. I don't know if you have tried to learn to ski, but it, it's also a practical skill. You know, you're, you're standing on these skis going down a slope and there are different ways to do it. So the programmers I work with all know how to program. They can code, they can ski down a slope. Mm -hmm. But if they need to learn a new technique for coding, like refactoring or TDD, it's like learning a different way of skiing. And you wouldn't expect to be able to learn to ski just by kind of trying it out by yourself. And, mm. you know, you'd expect to have skiing lessons and an instructor and trying out beginner slopes yeah, and working your way up to a more complicated slope. So if you're going to learn refactoring skills, it's good, you know, get some lessons, get a teacher, get a mentor, get someone to ski next to you down the hard slope the first few times mm. and show you how to do it. And I think one of the key things for me is that refactoring is not trivial. The ability to improve code and make it easier to understand and cheaper to modify is not a simple skill it's something that you develop over time and that you get better and better at and that is worth considering as a first class citizen as a thing that is worth learning rather than just a thing that just sort of happens yeah so one of the questions you asked earlier that you didn't come back to yet yeah was about what to do when you get to this state where your code is in a terrible state Literally, you've read my mind. I was about to ask you that question. So, yes, Emily, what do you do? <laughs> right. Because quite often also you'll be taking over another piece of code that you didn't even write yourself that is in a terrible state. Yes. And this is a situation I often find teams in when I come to them. Mm. They're struggling and they're not happy. It's not fun working with code you don't understand and you're afraid to break. It's difficult. So I have this analogy I use with chest of drawers. So like this piece of code that you've been asked to look after is like this chest of drawers or dresser. I think Americans call it a dresser. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of stuff in this thing. It's been in your house for years and years and you're not entirely sure what's in all the drawers, but it's essential, you know? Yeah. You can't get rid of this piece of furniture because it's important. The first thing to do is to pick a drawer and try and pull it out. Take a piece of your system that's important that you might need to change and pull it out. You've got to be able to isolate it in a test harness, basically. And that step is as far as I can tell, unique for whichever system you're working with. Mm. I don't have a recipe for that. I know that if you've got a, a large piece of code that's difficult, you probably shouldn't start with all of it. You should slice off a piece, pull out a drawer. Mm -hmm. And how you break those dependencies, yeah, that's, that's a skill in itself. But once you've got that and you've got it in a test harness and you've managed to write one test, then you're rolling. Yeah. Then you can suddenly start to add more tests and, and get coverage over the whole thing and really pin down the behavior of that thing. And that's where I start to use a technique like approval testing. Mm -hmm. So that drawer that I've pulled out is much bigger than a unit that I would have in a normal unit test. So I don't think the same techniques apply. I think it's a different situation and I would use different tools. In my experience, approval testing is a really good approach for this. And that, again, might be a challenge. You've got to maybe find realistic test data and go to the customer and find out how they use this thing and what the business rules are. But once you've then got enough test coverage that you feel confident, then you can refactor it. Mm. Then you can start to improve the design. Yeah, yeah. And so your approval tests are effectively saying these are all of the different ways that I expect this code to behave. 
all of the different ways that are important. So all of the edge cases that I know are important and that I want to preserve. And once I've been able to define what this code does and how it behaves already, because I already know that it works, and I have tests that automate that and express that so that I can run the test and check that it is always behaving in the way that I think it will behave. Then when I start changing it, I'll know if I've broken it because the test will start failing. Yeah. Yeah. And something I've noticed actually when I've done this myself is quite often in the process of writing the approval test, you will find bugs. Because actually, you're deliberately expressing every edge case and you're saying, well, what would it do in this scenario? And what would it do in this scenario? And how does it behave in these circumstances? And somebody will tell you, well, in these circumstances, it's supposed to do this. And then you write the test and you're like, well, actually, you know what? (laughs) And so often I found that you maybe want to start by either noting that the bugs exist and kind of recognizing that these tests are currently failing, but we know they are and this is what we expect. Or maybe fix those bugs and then go on to do the refactor. It depends what state it's in and how well you know it yes yes and i i'm a bit uncomfortable about this because the thing is if the thing is in production people are using it relying on it if you find something you think is a bug somebody might well be relying on that behavior Mm, yeah it's very dangerous actually to just start oh it's a bug i'll fix it i think you have to be quite careful so in a sense really what you're doing is you're simply using those tests to observe the existing behavior and preserve and document and say this is how this thing behaves in all of these different scenarios we're going to document that we're going to automate it we're going to find a way of checking that it continues to behave in that way so that then when we change it we know that we we haven't changed it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's the essence of a regression test. I mean, that's what you, you create with approval testing techniques. Mm-hmm. You'll notice if the behavior changes and uh, you have to make an explicit choice whether to approve any changes that you do insert. And you can have a conversation about those changes with business people who actually maybe understand whether that is a bug or mm. who will be impacted if you change it. Yeah. And I really enjoy this whole process. I mean, for me, refactoring is like tidying up. And tidying up can be really satisfying. So uh, I was away last week and I was doing some recording and I took a lot of recording equipment with me, which means that I had a lot of cables, basically all in a box, all tangled up. And there's a bit of an analogy there for me that you've got some cables and you're not even sure how many, but you're trying to isolate them from one another. And that feels analogous to me to the business of finding the dependencies and isolating one chunk of thing. Because once you've isolated one cable, then you can start to untangle that one cable without having to worry about all of the other cables that are also caught up inside it. But for me, the business of, first of all, isolating a component, which, as you say, is different every time and is also not always trivial. And then the business of writing the test harness. Both of those things are highly satisfying to me. Yeah. You're making things tidy and you're making things observable and definable. But I imagine that, you know, depending on what you're working with, both of those steps can take time. And and you do want to do both of those steps before you move on to the next bit. Yes, before you start refactoring too much. I mean, you will have to make some changes in order to isolate that thing. Mm. But you've got to try and do that in a safer possible way with perhaps manual testing or something else as backup. Yeah. But then, so once you've got it in your test harness, you've pulled out the drawer, then you can start covering it in tests, sorting it out, pulling out all the socks, you know, (laughs) finding out what's in there, getting it all covered with tests. And then you can refactor it and start to put everything back neatly and in the way that's going to make it really easy to add the new features you need to add. Yeah, I guess there's a bit of a catch 22, isn't there, at the beginning of the process that in order to isolate it and test it, you might have to make changes. Yeah. So what techniques can you use at that point to stay as safe as possible? Exactly what change you're going to make depends so much on what system it is. But you've you've just got to be really cautious, generally, and use your knowledge of the language. You've got a compiler you can lean on. To a certain extent, your normal manual testing and release processes that you already have in place, which might be very slow and, and unsatisfactory, but hopefully you can make some progress. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess also, again, small steps. So just change the smallest possible thing you can and then check a thing still working so that you can easily isolate where problems were introduced if they were introduced. 
Yeah, and if you have access to anyone who actually knows the code, anyone who actually wrote it, that can really help you because mm-hmm. they uh, might be able to point you in the right direction and show you places where you can break dependencies in a safe way. Yeah. But that's not always possible. Quite often you're working with code that everyone who built it's left long ago. While I've got your attention, let me tell you a bit about Made Tech. After 21 years in the industry, I'm quite choosy about who I'll work for. Made Tech are software delivery experts with high technical standards. We work almost exclusively with the public sector. We have an open source employee handbook on GitHub, which I love. We have unlimited annual leave. But what I love most about Made Tech is the people. They've got such passion for making a difference and they really care for each other. Our Twitter handle is Made Tech. That's M-A-D-E-T-E-C-H. We have free books available on our website at madetech.com slash resources slash books. And we're currently recruiting in London, Bristol, South Wales and the north of England via our Manchester office. If you go to madetech.com slash careers, you can find out more about that. Here's a quick reminder that before the break, we were talking about refactoring old code that's built up a significant number of problems, maybe written by people who are no longer available, and the techniques you can use to address that. What common issues do you see cropping up or mistakes that people make when they are trying to refactor? I come back to it's about skill. Mm -hmm. People who don't realize that they're missing a trick, that actually they're taking a way too big a step Mm. and they've just broken the code and there was no need to break the code. There was a much safer route that they could have taken to get to that position that they just seem to be unaware of Mm. because they've never been shown that there is a better way to do it. And they've never practiced on code carters or watched a demo with somebody refactoring. So yeah, that's the most common thing I see. I, I see somebody realize that they want to go from A to B. They can imagine B but they can't see the safe route there. They just try and jump straight there. They've broken the code and I'm just like, don't do that. (laughs) Stop. So you just said what people often do is they try to do too much. And I've definitely noticed that in myself. In fact, funnily enough, just last week, I was uh, refactoring a bit of code and I made a change. And in the midst of making the change, spotted another change. So I incorporated the new change, which meant that now this was all spidering out into several touching bits of code. And luckily I spotted it and thought, whoa, hang on a minute. Okay. Rewind the original change, focus on the new change and make that one first, and then go back to the other change that you were trying to make, because the the, the second one will actually facilitate the first one. Yes. And that's a a classic. You're not being afraid to back out your changes and relying that you can do that one again in a minute when you've sorted the other thing out. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I should probably mention the Mikado method here, which is a method basically for planning large refactorings. Mm -hmm. Because you've just had the example there where you could back out the first thing and then finish the second thing. But the thing is, it can chain. You can discover when you're trying to do the second thing. Oh, no, actually, there's a third thing I need to do first. Mm. And the Mikado method is a way of making a map. Basically, I have to do this thing first and then I can do those other things. So a lot of refactoring can be just exploring, trying to find that route to make that change safely and backing stuff out a lot. So tell me a little bit more about the Mikado method then. How how does it work? Right. So I'm not I'm not a world renowned expert on this. (laughs) You don't have to be a world renowned expert. It's fine. (laughs) My understanding of the Mikado method, it's about you've got a, a big goal for a big refactoring you want to do. And you start chipping away at it and then you discover, ah, actually, before I can make this change that I want to do, there's this other change. And the Mikado method is about making a map. It's a way of visualizing that so that the whole team can see progress. Yeah. It makes refactoring something that a whole team can collaborate over, over a period of weeks or however long it's going to take a big refactoring to happen. Yeah, yeah. And also, if you're doing it over a period of weeks, but if you're also following the paradigm of only ever making very small changes, always having the code buildable after each small change and the tests runnable, then that also means that you can run a refactor in parallel with business as usual. It doesn't necessarily have to be a separate project. Exactly. I mean, it will depend on the code, but ideally you should just be able to make one small change and everything still works. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the safe way to do it. I mean, 
don't go off into a branch, refactor the code in a branch and then think, oh, now the refactoring is ready three months later. I'll just merge it back into master. Uh Yes. I I say this because I did this once when I was very young and naive and didn't know much about refactoring. (laughs) I was so excited about this idea and I could see that we needed to refactor this code base I was working on. And my boss believed me when I said to him, if you give me three months, I'll go and sort this out for you. And I sat in this branch for three months refactoring just the merge problems when I tried to go back it was just like why did no one warn me (laughs) you know what I did exactly the same thing you've just reminded me really yeah it was when I was at late rooms I had an idea for refactoring and there were at least two problems with my approach one of them was that I personally had decided that I knew what a better structure for this code would be And really what I was doing was making the code make sense to me. A lot of it genuinely was an improvement, but a lot of it just made it really confusing to everybody else. Yeah. (laughs) So I did this refactor and then tried to merge it. And not only was the merge absolutely horrendous, partly because I'd renamed everything, but also even when other people looked at it and tried to help me, they were like, but what what have you done? This makes no sense to me. (laughs) Yeah, so... (laughs) Yeah, don't do that. Refactoring is it's a culture and it's skill and it's a, the whole team should be involved. Yeah. And and what we've just touched on actually comes back to a topic that I spoke to G. Paul Hill about, which is trunk-based development. And that I am not a fan of branches. And I know G. Paul agrees. And I'm guessing you agree yeah. that if you can keep everything in, in one branch, then everybody's working for the same code always. Yes. And you can see what impact your changes will have. Yes, I've always regretted when I've made branches in the code I've worked on. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, well, brilliant because I agree. (laughs) (laughs) So, I mean, I think we might have covered it all. Are there any top refactoring tips or do you just want to summarise top refactoring tips? Practice on code that doesn't matter or, or practice and then throw away your branch. Just practice refactoring to get fluent with it. Get a teacher or a mentor to help you learn it, a coach. Then the, the other thing I was going to mention, something that I, I like to do is I find a really tricky piece of code. I really like to make it into an exercise so that I can do it, practice it and show it to other people and see how they would solve it. So I don't know if this is just me, but I like collecting little exercises and I've got a GitHub page full of them. And so some of them are inspired by actual, real, horrible pieces of production code I've worked on, where I've just managed to carve out that piece that was the refactoring, interesting refactoring problem. Yeah. And anonymize the code to the extent that I felt it was okay to put it on GitHub. And then I can actually have this as an exercise and practice and see how other people would do this refactoring. Mm. That really interests me. So. And that is something that is absolutely worth plugging several times when I've been working with groups of people and I've been mentoring or running workshops and I've wanted a refactoring exercise. I've gone to Emily's GitHub page because there are loads of them. I mean, it's amazing. It's a fantastic resource because not only does it have all of these exercises, but they're all available in multiple languages. And they have approval tests written for you so that you have a starting point. Honestly, it's a really quite an amazing resource. I can't imagine how much work you must have put into it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm a coach. I use all these exercises with my clients. And then by putting them on GitHub, people send me translations. I mean, I've got all these language translations, but I haven't done most of them, I don't think. <laughs> mm. So I get something back. I mean, I coach teams working in all different programming languages. So now, uh, hopefully, I've got my exercises in the languages I need. Mm. So, yeah, I think it's a win-win, me putting all my exercises on GitHub. Yeah, yeah. And it actually, that's another really useful principle in general that I keep kind of relearning, which is that when you make things public, when you encourage collaboration and contribution... Win-win. Yeah, exactly. Is that It's it's always good to get other people to contribute to, to the work that you're doing and, and to collaborate to make things open because you just you get better results. Yeah. Okay, so we're we're out of time now. So I'm going to move on to the questions that I always ask every guest. I'm going to start with just a little game that we play where I'm going to ask you to tell me something that's true about you and something that's untrue. And then we won't tell our listeners which is which. We'll ask them to subscribe to our newsletter if they want to know which is which. So one thing that's true, one thing that's not true, but don't tell me which is which. Okay, so I've spent an inordinate amount of time thinking about this. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> so I'm going to see if this one works. So um, the reason why I started a Python user group in Gothenburg was mainly because I wanted to find a new job where I could program Python. Okay. So that's one of my uh, things. And then the other thing was the same event. You know, I started a Python user group in Gothenburg mainly because I wanted to have a group where I could learn how to lead coding dojos so that I could transition to a career as a technical coach. Ooh, okay. So which was my reason for starting a Python user group? Mm. So you were either trying to learn Python. I was either trying to find a job with programming Python. Yeah, so you either trying to find a job or you were trying to work out how to run coding dojos. Okay, interesting. So to end on a high, what's the best thing that's happened to you this month? can be either work-related or non-work-related in the last month or so. I had a really busy September doing some coaching and also some training. And the the highlight was actually the training that I did. I did a, a course in approval testing for a small group remote, and they were so enthusiastic and, and interested and fun to program with. And I always love explaining about approval testing to people because it's such a powerful technique that not enough people know. Mm. I got such a, a buzz from showing them how to do it and they seem to get the idea and be interested to try it out. So that really gave me a, a high, actually. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Actually, I was going to say before as well, because when I first came across the concept of approval testing, I thought, oh, this is an awful lot like the Golden Master approach. And it took me ages to discover that it just is. It is the golden master approach. But again, it's a language thing that, you know, the word master has got the connotation of slavery. It's not a great word. So approval testing is just a nicer phrase for the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it just it puts the uh, the emphasis in the right place about the human step of approving the output and deciding that this is what we want to preserve as the behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, Uh, so where can people find you? And do you have anything coming up that you'd like to plug? Yeah, so um, I've got my website, samancoaching.org, where I've got lots of materials, teaching and coaching materials to back up my book, which you can find on LeanPub. It's called Technical Agile Coaching with the Saman Method. Ah, thank you. Yes. (laughs) And hopefully I'm going to be running a course with O'Reilly in approval testing now. Mm. So that hopefully will get a little bit of a wider audience for these techniques. And that's coming up in the, the new year. Brilliant. Okay. And there will be links in the show notes for all of this. Okay. Thank you very much for speaking to me. Well, thank you for having me. It's absolutely a pleasure. As always, to help you digest what you've just heard, I'm going to attempt to summarise it. So what is refactoring? It's an integral part of code development. It's a word that can be used as a noun. A refactoring is a thing. It's a change to the software's internal structure that makes it easier to understand and cheaper to modify without changing its observable behavior. And that definition comes from Martin Fowler's very famous book about it, which contains a catalog of specific refactorings that can be applied. But refactoring is also a verb that describes the act of restructuring your software. Refactoring can sometimes become a very large project if there is a significant gap between the design you have and the design you need in order to add necessary features. This can involve difficult conversations about weeks of work with no visible difference. You can avoid this by constant small attention to detail, small continuous improvements. If you're using test-driven development, you might not refactor on every single test, but you should have it built into your process. But refactoring is broader than just those small changes you make when you're writing your tests. Refactoring is a culture and it's a skill, which is not simple. It's a skill which is learned over time, which benefits from teaching and mentoring, from pairing with somebody who's experienced. And often a great technique is to work as an ensemble or mob so that you can all refactor together and see the benefit. There are exercises, cutters that you can use to improve your refactoring skills. And by doing this as a team, this means that the refactoring can be a culture which spreads to everybody because everybody needs to be able to do it. When you're refactoring old code, which has built up a significant number of problems over time, you can think of it as being like an old chest of drawers full of stuff. It might have been written by people who are no longer available. So there's a lot of preparation that you have to do before embarking on a large refactoring project. 
you need to isolate specific areas of code. And the way that you do that will be different in every case. But what you want to do is make sure that the area you're dealing with is covered by approval tests and regression tests. And be mindful of the code that's in production. Don't assume that you're finding bugs without verifying that very carefully. And while you're refactoring, always move in very small steps. You may have to make use of existing manual testing and release processes before you have a good suite of approval tests built up. And if you have access to the original authors of the code, make use of that, although you may not have that access. You can use the Mikado method to plan ahead and make a map of your refactoring. There are common mistakes that people make when they're refactoring. Don't try to do too much at once, move in small steps. And don't be afraid to rewind if you find yourself getting stuck with many changes at once. Learn how to make good use of trunk-based development rather than relying on branches and storing up future problems when you have to merge back in again. And don't treat it as a sole loan exercise. Get the whole team involved. Emily's top tips are to work in small steps, look for the safest route to where you're trying to get, Practice on code that doesn't matter or practice on existing code, but in a branch and then throw it away. Look for good examples to use as exercises. OK, I should probably mention my own article on the subject, which is published on Martin Fowler's website, which is a worked example of a real code base that I was working on. There'll be a link to that in the show notes. OK, stick around for extra content. Every other episode, this last short segment will be devoted to story time. Storytelling is useful for teaching, for unlocking empathy, and for creating a sense of shared connection and trust in your teams. I love telling stories to both children and adults. I'm actually a lapsed member of the UK Society for Storytelling. So the plan is that I'm going to be using stories to illustrate various points about effective software development. I make no assumptions, but if you follow me on Twitter, you may have seen me post about this immediately after it happened. OK, so about once a year, I visit a tiny little cottage in the Lake District on my own for a week to get stuff done. And this year, I split the time between making musical videos for TikTok and working on my iOS puzzle game app. It's very remote, it's very basic, and generally what I do is I hire a van and I take with me a desk and a chair. And this time I also had a van full of computer equipment and recording equipment and a bike for exercise. OK, so on the way home is when the drama happened. I stopped at a service station, just a quick stop, toilet and tea, came outside. Oh, no. What? Where's the van? It was evening, about eight o'clock. There were very few cars around and it was a very small car park. And I could see immediately the van was gone. But still, I walked back and forth, up and down. Surely it must be hiding behind another vehicle. But no, it was gone. But, but what about all my stuff? I was thinking, how will I get home? And all my work. There was no internet at the cottage, so nothing that I'd done had been uploaded to the cloud yet. It was all lost. Hours of recordings of audio and video... Hours of code written, bugs fixed, new features implemented, all lost. I finally realised I was just going to have to ring the police. By this point, I was hyperventilating. But I was thinking, OK, what do I do? I guess I ring 999 and then maybe they can find it on their cameras. Maybe they can stop it on the motorway. I mean, how do people even steal vehicles anymore? And it was definitely locked. I had the keys in my hand and I could remember locking it. So I rang 999 and I got a lovely, kind woman on the other end of the phone to whom I will be eternally grateful. 
She was checking, was I absolutely sure that the van was gone? Did I have the key to it? The answers were yes and yes. Where was I? So I told her I was at Lancaster Services and she was checking, did I mean Fortin? And I wasn't even sure that that's what it was called. So I was saying, it's the one with the tower. And I was looking up, I was standing in the car park and I could see the tower um, towering over me. She was trying to calm me down because the full enormity of what had happened was hitting me. I was still pacing up and down the car park with the phone. She put me on hold for a while and I was thinking, it just seems so crazy. Surely the van can't have gone, but it definitely wasn't there. So I was thinking, well, could it somehow be somewhere else? But how? That was definitely the car park. I could see the exit going off to the motorway and I had a clear memory of entering the service station at the door that I could see. So I was thinking, well, I mean... Could there somehow be another car park round the back somewhere? But I was so sure that was it only one car park until, oh, ah, OK, hang on a minute. Of course, there is one other car park, an identical one, on the other side of the motorway. And then I remembered when I entered the service station, there was a sign telling me that if I wanted tea or coffee, I'd have to cross the bridge to the other side of the motorway, which I had completely forgotten about when I came out carrying my tea and just exited straight into the car park on the wrong side of the motorway. And of course, if I'd thought about it, the tower was my clue because it's on the other side of the motorway. I was still on hold to the emergency services, but I was already straight back inside the service station, crossing the bridge. And sure enough, there was the van. The operator came back on the phone and I explained and she was so kind and sympathetic. Bless her. She told me this kind of thing happens all the time. So, what can be learnt from this story? Well, the obvious thing is don't make assumptions. And there's the basic principle of Occam's razor, which tells you what's the simplest, most likely explanation for what is happening. But the big thing is don't panic. And I know that's easier said than done, but as soon as you start panicking, you stop thinking. And I wasn't thinking clearly. It took me a long time to work out what had actually happened because I was panicking and I wasn't thinking effectively. And the last thing is something that I confess I do struggle with, but it's so useful, particularly when you're in a difficult situation. Take a step back, a look at the bigger picture. And in this case, literally the bigger picture. If I could have raised up into the sky and looked down with a bird's eye view at my surroundings, I would have seen the identical car park with the van in it. And I could have done that in my head as well, because obviously I'm not suggesting that we should all learn to fly. So anyway, it took a while for the adrenaline to subside, but hopefully you're as glad as I am that this story has a happy ending. Working in the public sector means that at Make Tech we really care about making a difference. So for this final Making Life Better segment, myself and my colleagues will be sharing suggestions for small things we can do to make the world a better place. So I have Kaylee Derricott here with me. She's a delivery manager at Made Tech, and she's going to give us a bit of advice about, well, I don't want to say it in my words, actually. So what are you going to give us advice about, Kaylee? I'm going to give you some advice about how to interact with colleagues or friends who maybe have differences from you. Fantastic. Thank you. So what is your advice? My advice is to hesitate. I think a lot of people say things immediately as they come to mind and afterwards there's some scrambling to take things back and often the damage is already done and as the person who's receiving the uncomfortable comment it can be much more damaging than the moment of discomfort you feel saying the uncomfortable comment. So my advice is to hesitate and to really think about whether you're saying this thing because of the difference you have with this person. So in my example, are you asking me a question or saying something to me because I'm black or because I'm a woman? And if it's because of one of those specific things, then question whether you actually still need to say it. Yeah, yeah. Do you have any examples? 
the classic example, which I think not just black people, but most non-white people will have heard is, where are you from? Oh no, where are you really from? So if I answer I'm from London, that should be sufficient. And if a white person had given the same answer, that would be the end of the conversation. Yeah. The follow up question is where the hesitation should come. So are you asking where am I really from? Because it's important to the conversation we're having or because I'm black and that intrigues you. And if it's not important to the conversation we're having, then don't ask the question. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. That's really helpful. No worries. And that's the end of another episode. If you're enjoying the podcast, please do leave us ratings and reviews because it pushes us up the directories and makes it easier for other people to find us. I've got a few talks coming up. You can see the details on my events page on Medium, which is linked to from my Twitter profile. And you can find that at Claire Sudbury, which is probably not spelt the way that you think. There's no I in Claire and Sudbury is spelt E-R-Y at the end, the same as surgery or carvery. You can find Made Tech on Twitter at M-A-D-E-T-E-C-H and do come and say hello. We're very interested to hear your feedback and any suggestions you have for any content for future episodes or just to come and have a chat. Thank you to Rose, our editor, Gina Cady, our virtual assistant, Viv Andrews, our transcriber, Richard Murray for the music, there's a link in the description, and to the rest of our internal MedTech team, Kyle Chapman, Jack Harrison, Carson Robb and Laura Plaga. Also in the description is a link for subscribing to our newsletter. We publish new episodes every fortnight on Tuesday mornings. Thank you for listening and goodbye. <laughs>